Hi there, and welcome to a rather special edition of Locad TV. Today, I'm delighted to say we're joined by Amory Seche, the lead developer at Bitcoin ABC, and arguably one of the most prominent experts in the world of Bitcoins. About a year ago, Amory and his team at Bitcoin ABC prevented Bitcoin from running into major operational problems. Today, we're going to be talking about economic cartels. I'm delighted to say I'm also joined by Johannes Vermeral, the CEO of Locad. Um, so gents, I feel like I've probably got my hands a little bit full today, but thanks very much for joining us. So put simply, uh, cartels are a type of market where the participants not only compete, but they also cooperate. So Amory, if we kick things off with you, perhaps mm -hmm. you could define with us exactly what cartels are and how they relate to Bitcoins. Okay, so a cartel is a, a weird market situation where you have a set of actors in the market that are competitors with each other, but they choose to cooperate for some reason. Um, and, and so it, it creates this, this bizarre association of people that are cooperating, but at the same time it's, it's fairly unstable because they are competitors, right? Um, and, and you would not believe that it's very common, but it's actually a very, very common economic situation. So we have cartel in, in so maybe like the most obvious stuff is the, the drag kind of market. This is where the word is used the most. But uh, uh, in the telecom market, it's very common. Uh, and in, in Bitcoin, more specifically in Bitcoin, so the miners um, are somewhat of a cartel because, so they are competitors with each other. They, they try to mine more blocks than the other to, to have more revenue. But at the same time, they accept each other's block because it helped them to have a longest chain that have more proof of work. And so they find themselves in the situation where they have to cooperate to build that chain, but at the same time they compete with each other to have as many blocks as possible within the chain. And so we're in a, a typical cartel situation here where we have a uh, cartel kind of economics that apply. But I feel like the whole point of Bitcoins, it's all about sort of economic freedom, isn't it? So why are we sort of talking about Bitcoin and cartels in sort of the same breath? Well. Cartel has a bad reputation. Um, it's it's not always bad. So, what happens quite often um, is that when you have a cartel, then the the different actor in the cartel lobby the government um, to essentially prevent anyone that is not from the cartel to compete with the cartel, right? So the typical example of that would be a mobile phone. Quite often, like in most country, you have license for mobile phone that are very expensive. And it creates a situation where you have different mobile phone providers um, that compete with each other, but at the same time, there is no new entrant on the market. And so they have a de facto cartel where there is no exit situation, right? So naturally, on the free market, the, the cartel situation has a NESCAP badge, right? Where a NESCAP badge? Es escape badge. Escape badge, yeah, okay, yeah, right. right. Where um, what happens is that because the members of the cartel are naturally competitor, if the market is not working for them anymore, they mm -hmm. are just going to dissolve the cartel. Okay. And if we look at what happened in Bitcoin, this is what happened essentially in August last year, right? So uh, various set of miners stopped cooperating with each other and building on the same chain. And so now we have uh, two flavor of Bitcoin because of that, mm -hmm. right? So essentially we had originally one cartel of miners that were building on one chain and now we have um, at least, I'd say like two big ones and a few other right, smaller others. ones that, that cooperate on, on various chains but don't cooperate with each other anymore. Nice. So yeah, so that's, that's, the, um, that's the aspect that people are not that familiar with because they are used at, you know, um, government enabled kind of cartel which okay. doesn't have to be the case. Fair. And Johannes, how about from a supply chain perspective? Um, are there cartels in supply chains as well? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the word cartels is heavily loaded with, I would say, uh, negative opinions. So technically, if you look at the Wikipedia page, you would say it's, uh, it's actually something that is typically illegal. And, um, uh, but it's interesting to understand why people are usually considering it illegal and uh, exactly. So we have a situation where we have competition, just as Amory outlined, and cooperation. And the most, I would say, the dumbest co cooperation type of cooperation is just price fixing. So if you have, and that's basically Europe just had, I think, the largest fine ever for the, the cartel of elevators. So it was, I think, uh, something like 1 billion point four euro of, of um, 
uh, uh, of payment due for basically a cartel-like structure among four companies who were basically doing price fixing. So price fixing is, uh, I would say, generally re recognized as very, very bad because it only profit to the people in the cartel with no side effects positive for uh, the market at large. Now, what really interesting me uh, a lot in Bitcoin, uh, because I think it's, it's it illustrates some interesting properties that might become the future of, of, of supply chain, actually, is when you have very, very tight cooperation and you have very good emergent properties for the market at large. It's not, you see, the point is that cooperating is not all bad. You know, if, if you cooperate in a way that for people that are outside the cartel, they benefit from it, it's not, uh, it's not like everybody is a loser and the people within the cartel are the winners. So let's, have an, uh, let's illustrate that in, in supply chain, for example, uh, in aerospace industry. In aerospace industry, I mean, um, the idea is that you're a company, you're an airline, who are you going, you have a um, situation called, for example, aircraft on ground, AOG incidents. It just means that a spare part is missing and you want to very rapidly source a spare part. So the idea is that you're, you're going to buy a spare part at, uh, from someone who can sell a, a spare part to you. And typically it's going to be your competitor. So it's interesting because it's an airline that is going to buy a part from another airline and the other airline is going to sell this part at a very steep price. But the other airline is not going to buy from anyone. They are just going to have only a short list of airlines who they source from. So basically you can make a lot of profit by you know, sourcing AOG parts but you have to be kind of in the circle. Why? Because uh, an airline is, is security is paramount. You don't want to, to mount a part that you do not trust fully. So that restricts your options, you know, to, to where you, are you going to source the parts. So you have this very cartel-like situation where you have very, very tight cooperation. People cooperate to keep their aircraft flying all the time, although they are competitors uh, and they do not accept anybody in the club, but they have very, very good reason, and that's um, uh, uh, safety. So you see, you have, an, uh, as, a, as just someone who travel once in a while through, uh, through aircraft, you have, you benefit from this cartel in the form of security. So it's not all bad. It's because of that, that the aerospace industry has been making such incredible progress in, in security. I mean, there is one good reason why Whenever an air crash, an aircraft make a, cra a crash makes the news, it's because it's so rare, actually. Okay. So, so, so you have those properties, and Bitcoin is shaping the, the way forward about this very, very tight cooperation. So we talk about the properties, you sort of pulled out a real key one there, which is cooperation. Perhaps, Amory, have you got any more properties of a cartel that you could sort of explain yes, to us? Yeah, so on an economy front, um, cartel are unstable because the member of the cartel are competitors. So if anything goes wrong, like, you know, if, if anything moves the state of affair outside of the usual equilibrium, then usually the cartel just dissolve. Uh, but they're also hyper efficient, right? Because there is a ton of inefficiency that arises from competition between actors that can be eliminated if they choose to cooperate. And usually the people in the cartel benefit from that, but all the customer also benefit from that most of the time. Uh, like the, the airplane example from Johannes is, is one example of that. So it's not bad per se, right? It's more efficient. This is like the, the upside of cartel that is usually uh, forgotten. Like the word has a bad, I think, you know, bad connotation. But um, there is an upside, and the upside is cartel tend to be uh, hyper efficient economically. Okay, so the upside is hyper efficiency. The downside is going to be inherent unstableness. Yes. So can trust ever be put in cartels in a in a form of bitcoins? Can we really be trusting them? Well, I think we can. Like we've seen that. Um, oh, there, there is another characteristic of cartel is that the, the biggest member of the cartel tend to have. Um, you know, control over where the cartel is going and the smaller members of the cartel don't have that much influence on the direction of the cartel. So uh, people in Bitcoin talk a lot about centralization and to some extent having a cartel of minor, um, you know, includes some degrees of centralization because that means that the biggest miner actually uh, gonna have a disproportionate influence on the general direction of the project. Mm -hmm. But 
it also means that they need to do so in, in such a manner that the smaller miner are going to be kept happy, or at least sufficiently happy, so they decide to stay in the cartel. Okay. Right? Because if the biggest member of the cartel decide to act in a way that is against the interest of the smaller uh, member of the cartel, then the smaller member of the cartel, it becomes in their interest to leave the cartel and, and split off. Okay. Johannes, you got any thoughts on how this trust can be created within uh, cartels? Yes, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. Maybe first to, to also shed lights on how it's relevant to Bitcoin, uh, to, to supply chain, sorry, is that um, the cooperation, what is very interesting with, with Bitcoin is that this cooperation is super, super tight, like machine light. So, um, and that brings, you know, a whole new level of cooperation. You know, there is the old school cooperation. It's just, you know, you sit in a room, you just agree on the price and you're done with it. But it's not very, very tight cooperation here in Bitcoin. It's, it's literally software that, is, that has to be completely compatible. And you have like a one byte incompatibility, you get a fork. That's pretty bad. You, you had one currency, you have now two. Uh, so it's, it, it brings the degree of cooperation to a, a level of details that is, uh, I would say, much, much greater than, you know, old school, I would say, cartel cooperation. And with supply chain, what is interesting is that if you think about the future of supply chain, and we get back to the trust, but just to, 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 to illustrate so that we can illustrate where the trust comes from. Uh, or, um, uh, uh, for the future of supply chain, there is many things that can be pooled. You know, you have a fleet of trucks, maybe tomorrow a fleet of autonomous trucks. If you're not using them, maybe you can lend them to your competitor. Your competitor can take advantage of your own spare capacity and similarly. So, so instead of having everybody has, you know, all the infrastructure duplicated, like everybody has full uh, w duplicate warehouses, duplicate fleet, duplicate everything. If you have like cooperation at the machine level, you know, you have like real time computer driven protocols to just have everything completely tightly organized. You can think of things that would be radically more efficient in terms of inventory allocation, transport, transport capacity allocation, everything. So that's, that, I believe, is, is very interested. So that goes and, back to sort of the and, efficiency we were talking exactly. about Exactly, and then yeah. we will end up with a trust, which is exactly what happens if you have, let's say, a leader of that, let's say Amazon or whoever is, you know, the leader of this kind of supply chain 2.0 version that is like super tightly integrated with, uh, with literally machine protocols in the middle. What are going to be the dynamics of this ecosystem? And that's where I think it's very interesting is that Bitcoin is a bit like a, a real illustration of what is happening in the real world when you have this sort of situation. So that, that gives you a good example, I think, of the sort of human dynam dynamics that can be expected once supply chain gets there. I think supply chains are not there yet at all. But maybe 10 years from now, maybe they will. And that's, that's interesting. And I, I would be surprised if it doesn't look like a bit like what is happening with, with Bitcoin right now. I don't know what are your thoughts on that, Emily. No, 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 I think that's Like a lot of people are talking about that from different angles. Like yeah, um, if you take stuff that happening with Uber and Lyft, for instance, to their logical conclusion is that you're gonna have a fleet of autonomous car in large cities that people are gonna share and pay, um, you know, to the proportion they use it. Uh, a lot of people are talking about this kind of stuff. And this is like the mini version miniaturized version of uh, what Johannes is talking. In that case, it's just like transportation, um, transportation facilities that are, you know, pulled together by different actors because, you know, just the technology made it more autonomous. But you can imagine the same kind of stuff actually for um, airplane parts, as he was talking earlier, or even like, you know, transportation between factories and, and merchants or, or um, factories and facility of uh, e-commerce company, you can imagine that you know there is a lot of there is a lot of those stuff that you can pull together, and as long as the different actor that want to pull together trust each other enough so mm -hmm. that works, it's gonna work and it's gonna be more efficient. Then, but as soon as you break the trust, then um, you get it, and and it's easy to break the trust, right? Because you can imagine that some actor would have actually an incentive to screw the others because they are competitors. Okay. So you can imagine that you're going to have this kind of So what you're talking about is we've got to trust each other, got to trust each other a lot, but there's yeah. going to be as a great as everybody, incentive. You know, as long as everybody play nice and trust each other, yep. uh, you get an hyper-efficient economic situation. Mm -hmm. But you got to keep in mind that each of those actors have an incentive 
at some point to actually screw uh, other actors. Okay, so we're talking about an incentive to screw other actors. What is that incentive? Well, they have an incentive to cooperate and, and an incentive to, to um, you know, be selfish and, and screw over other. And so the people that are the important actor in the, in, in the cartel need to make sure that for everybody, the incentive to cooperate is greater than the incentive to uh, be competitive, mm -hmm. right? But at some point, like, you know, people make errors, right? Yeah. Uh, so at some point, it's going to happen anyway, right? That's, that's the nature of market, and this is why they tend to... So you're basically saying that the nature point. of an economic cartel in a Bitcoin is at some point, everyone knows that at some point, somebody's going to screw everyone over, as you sort of said. Well, it's, it's possible. Um, it's possible that they screw someone over. It's also possible that just just disagree on what's the best thing to do is, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, like, they, they can be in their evil intent, but they, it's not necessary, right? It may just like be different different vision of, of what is best. And I think this actually happened, right? This is what happened in, in August last year, where you had Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash that separate. Like, you know, before you had just Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and then it separated into, into two. And this is what happened, right? You have different group of people that want to evolve things in, in, different, in different ways. ways. Yep. And at some point, the incentive to cooperate becomes smaller than the incentive to compete. And then people start to compete. Okay. So the cartel dissolves and you see two. So Johannes, have you got anything in a supply chain perspective where this sort of uh, splitting up has sort of happened? Have you got any examples that have happened here? Oh, uh, yes. I think the supply chain is full of situations where uh, for example, standards, you know, the tons of things can get standardized, but you have, uh, you have always, a, 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 um, I would say, a strategic interest to make a certain, a certain I would say, technology your standard and, and see if you can bring the market with you. You know, it, it can happen with RFID, with QR code, with even barcodes, actually, you know, it's, so, so you have a, a shared interest of everybody use the same sort of of, of, of barcodes, let's say, but if you have if you have a vendor and you can get enough traction behind you, then you can maybe have your own system that has some features that you want. I think Amory is right. It's not necessarily always about also about um, you know uh, I would say having a bigger share on the market. You can also disagree on the very thing you want to do. Uh, so if you if you disagree, for example, that um, a barcode should has more information, you know, you, you would say a barcode should be up to 20 digits and this is it, then obviously you completely disagree to, with other people who want, let's say, to do QR code where you, you can have a kilobyte of information. You know, it's a different perspective and people might not agree on what is the right conduct because also I think in cartels, everybody feels that they are not even going to be relevant tomorrow if the cartel as a whole is not good. You know, uh, for example, if uh, in supply chain, if the people who are in charge of barcodes, you know, GS1, X drives, if they stop being competitive in what they can do, in, in, in the, the costs they can deliver, um, uh, another group of people doing RFIDs will just so, uh, replace them. So you say it's a, so it's the cartel, they, there is competition within the cartel, but there is also the external world at large where um, if you're not, kind of always moving forward, you can be replaced by another cartel that just take a different angle at the same problem and displace you entirely. Um, so in, in supply chain, that would be uh, for, for type of standardization, barcode versus RFID, that's different ecosystem. I mean, there is some connection, but fundamentally it's, it's relatively different, uh, different sort of things. Um, uh, uh, sometimes there is uh, a standard is extremely sticky, like the size of a container, for example, size of a container is an extremely sticky standardization. It's very hard for people to deviate from that because there is so much yeah, infrastructure Yeah, trucks and in. boats and all the harbor infrastructure <laughs> yes. and all of that is made for a container. Exactly, but size. if there is an incredibly good use case to have something very, very different, it might happen. And if nobody wants to agree on that, uh, somebody might actually take a portion of the market with them. Okay, so we've spoken a lot about this tight cooperation. Let's introduce a new word now. Let's introduce the word collusion. When does that tight cooperation stop becoming collusion? Because collusion is illegal. It's not a great, great thing, right? I mean, there's got to be some sort of side yeah, effects. But yeah, the difference between cooperation and collusion is mostly artificial. It's like mostly how you choose to look at it. Yeah. Um, 
down to the fact it's it's the same um, it's the same behavior, right? So you would say maybe collusion is when uh, it starts not to be in the interest of people interacting in the cartel, mm -hmm. probably. So, for instance, um, uh, let's take let's take again the example of uh, mobile phone operators, right? Um, if they agree with each other to a very expensive price, um, they can do that because nobody else can can get on the market. Then they are in a, um, a cartel situation where um, they call it not to be more efficient economically, but to screw everybody else over, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, I'd say in those cases you could use the term collusion, but uh, it's very much like a judgment of value, yep. and value is inherently subjective. So what is what is cooperation or what is collusion is? It's a very gray area. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's very, very subjective, area. right? Um, but so what happened is that those those negative way of cooperating for the cartel they don't quite exist on the free market to the extent that they exist on the managed market, uh, because you can have new entrants. Right? And new entrant, uh, the, more you, the more you do this kind of stuff, say you do price fixing to have a very high price. This is actually what happened in France with, the, uh, with Free Mobile a few years ago. Um, you, you had three operators and they agreed with each other to have price that were pretty high. Right? And then there was a fourth operator that entered the market. And this operator had a very strong incentive to not join the market because if that operator uh, doesn't join the cartel, I mean, join the market, but doesn't join the cartel, because if that operator doesn't join the cartel, it can undercut the other operator by a very significant margin. Mm -hmm. and, and that way, get uh, uh, um, a lot of market share very, very quickly. So it's basically creating a type of competition, is that what you're sort of saying? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. because that, that new actor, if that new actor would enter the cartel, it would have a very small market share, it would have essentially the same price as everybody else. So not a lot of differentiating factors, right? So it's, it's not a very interesting value proposition for that new actor. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if that actor decides not to join the market, then they can have an offer that is on the market for customers that is significantly more interesting. Mm -hmm. And so they become a major actor in that market very, very quickly. And, and so if the market is not logged on and you can have new entrant in the market, or if members of the cartel are free to leave the cartel, then you end up with a, like a self-correcting mechanism. It's not the case though when the, say the government say you need to have a license to operate in, in that you know, specific field of mm -hmm. work. Um, in that case, it's not possible for you know, anybody else to come in and compete. So it's the case uh, for banks, or maybe we were talking about Uber earlier, but it's the case for taxis, for instance. And, and so, so you create like a banking cartel or a taxi cartel that um, is, is not very willing to cooperate on anything, right? Because um, it's, it's very difficult in general to have a, to have a new entrants that come in. So, yeah, to, to wrap in, like, you, you get those negative effects mostly when the cartel is enforced by law or enforced by incentive created by law more than when they occur economically naturally. Okay, nice. Janice, you got anything to add here? Yes, I think one of the very interesting angles from of Bitcoin for supply chain is that um, you can engineer, I mean, my perception is that you can engineer to some extent uh, the cooperation framework so that it reinforce positive cooperation instead of just like, again, negative collusion. It's a bit twice the same, sorry, it's, it's redundant, but it's uh, just to outline the thing. For example, in um, in Bitcoin, uh, you push a transaction that comes with transaction fee. It's to pay a miner. Any miner can decide to reject because it's too, it's too low. So it could basically try to push up the price. But the problem is that any other miner, 10 minutes afterward, will just pick up the transaction and include in a block. And so... Or not. Uh, or not. Right? But, but still, you know, it just takes one person yeah. to basically... Uh, to, to, to lower the price. So it, 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 it is engineered so that it's, it's difficult, not impossible, but kind of engineered so that it's, it's difficult for um, the cartel of miners to just agree on high yeah. transaction fees. Yeah, it's just very similar to the mobile phone yes. example, right? They can agree to push the price very, very high, but then it becomes in their interest. And, and the more you push the price higher, 
the more individual actor have an interest to defect from the cartel. Yeah, right? but just to give you an example of where I think in, uh, Bitcoin did engineer further is that switching from one mobile operator to another is still, you know, I mean, it takes, it takes hours to do. It's, uh, I mean, there is some significant friction cost. I mean, uh, obviously, some laws have been passed so that uh, because we have like so few actors so that it's, it's now mandatory to make things not too complicated for your own clients. But it's still a lot of friction to change from a mobile operator to another. I mean, it, you cannot have, if, if I would, you know, engineer the mobile market as you would engineer, you know, Bitcoin, you would dynamically have an auction like real time on who is going to be my carrier. Like mm -hmm. every time there is a phone call. Uh, and then there would be like this real time auction and beam, whoever bid the lowest bid would take it. So that would make, you know, the cartel a lot more unstable. And that's, that's also, I think, what is interesting for those um, maybe highly cooperative supply chain system of the future is that they will have to consider, you know, those, so, those, those sort of angle where you engineer instability, you know, in, in the cartel so that it's, it's a paradox. I, my, my belief is that if you engineer this instability, maybe that gives you better odds at having the, the cartel itself surviving longer. Yes. Is that not a real funny concept to engineer instability? Surely nobody's going to go out from the <laughs> onset and engineer that into their solutions. No, but so what happens is that if the system is fairly unstable, like unstable in a um, uh, scientific way, so instability in a scientific way, like a stable system is a system where, so you have a state of the system, whatever the system is, and for some reason, uh, the system deviate for its equilibrium state, naturally it's gonna go back to the equilibrium state, right? This is what a stable system, and an unstable system is a system where you have an equilibrium state, and when you start to deviate, unless someone, you know, bring it back bring to it the back. equilibrium, it's gonna deviate more and more and more and more by itself. And the thing is, if the, uh, the more unstable the cartel is going to be, and so if the cartel is very stable, it can go astray, you know, for quite some time before it actually dissolves, mm -hmm. right? But by that point, it's going to be too late to actually um, do anything, right? Um, it's going to be too far gone. So, like, the point of no return has actually been crossed for a while, but because the situation is very stable, it's going to take significantly longer uh, for everybody to actually realize that and, and take the you know economic steps uh, required to fix the situation, but it's f fairly unstable. Then everybody has to keep in mind that they need to do the right thing, because quite immediately the thing is gonna um, stop working. Uh, and so paradoxically, I, I think I think Johannes is right. Paradoxically, if the cartel is more unstable. Um, then you create a situation where the cartel member have a stronger incentive to behave right. Mm -hmm. and, and so you create a situation where it's quite possible that the cartel is actually going to last longer. Okay. So we've spoken a lot here about the benefits of tight cooperation, obviously things like improved efficiency. How about the negatives? Are there any more negatives that we can talk about here? I think in terms of negatives, um, again, for the future, system, future design of those super tightly cooperating supply chain framework, we can expect a lot of drama because you see the, 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 <laughs> the Bitcoin ecosystem, if one thing, it has never been short of drama. Yeah. Uh, because obviously, um, the funny thing is that those, you know, if those actors are just, um, you know, again, cartels done, I would say the old school way, which is just about price fixing, there is no benefits for anyone, so the discussion are always done very secretly. You know, if the the the, comp the, ele the companies that were manufacturing elevators who were who had been fined by Europe had never, you know, stated their position on this matter publicly, or not not as far I know. But the funny thing is that when you have a system where you have a cartel that is where people actually try most of the time to do things for the greater good of the ecosystem, they are very vocal about it, you know, in public. And so there is a lot of ongoing drama going on about the future direction and all those discussions that were typically only happening, you know, in closed office and you never hear about it. Maybe, for example, before Apple decided to launch the iPhone, 
there has been like 20 meetings where uh, Steve Jobs went mad and, you know, was completely in disagreement in things that still made their way into the final design of the iPhone. You know, we'd never know. I was not there. But, uh, but the funny thing is that it, it's uh, here, all those decisions, they tend to happen in public. And so there, there is like intense drama that is going on all the time. And I think in those supply chain, if you look at companies who operate supply chains, very little things go into public discussion. You know, there is, there is not that much going on in terms of online discussion. And I think that might be one of the things that is going to change the most is probably the, just the sheer amount of things that will be discussed much, much in public because uh, also being very, very visible for a member of the cartel is, all way, is also a way to exert influence. It's not just, that's, a, that's an interesting thing, it's just not the raw economic powers. If you have media audience, uh, you have... Well, that's another kind of economic power. Yeah, that's another kind of economic power, yeah, exactly. I don't know if you, if you can comment on the ongoing state of the community. I don't know in terms of dynamics, what you see. Uh, no, I agree, yeah. You have, you have a set of actors that are essentially uh, uh, competitors. And if they can cooperate, it's very beneficial for all of them, but they are still competitors. So you can expect a ton of drama. That's, yeah. that's like the and setup nothing, is... There's nothing the media quite likes, and especially the media we're referring to bitcoins as drama. So there's definitely a funny word we've mentioned there. And uh, speaking of drama, you mentioned it earlier, and obviously if you've got lots of competitors, eventually there's going to be some sort of betrayal. Uh, do you fancy just sort of explaining that for our viewers a little bit more? Sort of, what did you mean by betrayal of a cartel, and what's the, the reaction of the cartel? So, uh, if we talk about price fixing in a cartel, the thing is that there is an incentive. So if everybody cooperates, it's better for everybody, right? But you're kind of in the uh, prisoner dilemma situation where if one of the actors that do the price fixing decide to defect from the cartel and put like much lower price on the market, it's going to get uh, a lot of customer from its competitor uh, coming to, to him. Uh, just because the price is, is so much lower and the service is similar. And so there is a strong incentive for actor as a group to cooperate, but as individual to defect. And, and the more outrageous the price fixing that happens, and the stronger the incentive to defect, right? So you, you end up, yeah, you, you often, quite, you quite often end up with the situation where, um, you know, the longer the cartel goes and the more influence the cartel have and, and also the more interest some actor have to defect from the cartel. Okay, nice. Um, so I think we're sort of at the stage where we sort of start thinking about sort of closing sta statements. Obviously, the nice thing to think about when you're closing up is the future. So we'll start off with you, Johannes. How do you sort of see the future? How do you see cartels affecting the future of supply chains in reality? So I see the future of supply chain systems to be very much a bit like the economic dy dynamics that you have in Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a live economical system, you know, with real agent, real money that interacts programmatically real time. And it exhibits very market-like dynamics, you know, at internally within, you know, the cartel of Bitcoin mining, but also externally. So, and uh, I expect that the supply chain systems in the future, but it might take one decade or two to get there, will exhibit um, I would say dynamics that would be essentially similar with the same sort of tension on how do you define protocols, how do you define what is allowed, not allowed, how do you engineer the incentives so that um, the, 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 the system itself can last and people can externally have trust that even if people come and go within the cartel that is in charge, the external world can still trust, you know, the collective of the cartel to pretty much do what it was proposing to do as a, as, a, as a value proposition. So in the supply chain, that's going to be transportation, very collaborative, uh, probably inventory uh, management, uh, I would say resource allocation, these sort of things. And, um, and we are going to increasingly uh, go into this direction as we get, for example, additive manufacturing capabilities, you know, things that can be really manufactured on demand, but maybe you will want to rent those things are slow you know additive printing is slow uh, so maybe you want to rent the printing capacity of your competitor for your own need 
So you see, and, and I see so the tons of areas where there will be um, room to have like programmatic competition, real-time competition. Mm. And so I, I suspect that those systems will emerge. And people, I, I would say to maybe our supply chain audience, is that if you want to really anticipate what will happen is to have a closer look at what is presently happening in the Bitcoin ecosystem because I suspect it's just the future is just already there, just not evenly distributed. So that's what what people can expect like two decades from now in supply chain is already happening similarly in Bitcoin nowadays. That would be my closing thought. Nice. And Amri, your final thoughts is Bitcoin yeah. gonna have the global impacts that we're predicting? Um yeah, so Bitcoin is on money. I, I expect it to have, to have a lot of impact there, but it's kind of like outside of the scope of cartel. But um, otherwise, like more than the scope of cartel, I agree very much with Jonas in the sense that Bitcoin opened the door for um, digital cash that is decentralized. Um, and, and this is already a huge step, but I think one of the aspects that is missed, I think, by a lot of people is that uh, Bitcoins innovate quite a bit in the incentives uh, of cartel and nobody wants to talk about it in terms of cartel and this is why uh, because there is so much negative connotation to the word but like you know if you want to look at it in like a dispassionate manner like uh, like uh, an economist studying uh, a specific cartel then you have this very bizarre cartel where um, it's actually specifically engineered with specific rules that that are gonna keep people together tightly connected together and and um, it creates like this very unstable cartel essentially where, where everybody has to cooperate very closely and I tend to agree with Johannes that we're probably gonna have s we are going to see this kind of system uh, emerge in other area right like we, we are f we have just seen the beginning of that mm -hmm. um, you know so f so far we had like a very ad hoc way of creating cartel we you know like you know cartel in economics is like probably the one of the most talked subject and one of the most studied, studied subject. And because like people do them manually and they do them in all kinds of different ways. Uh, but now we have this incentive structure uh, that are programmatic, that incentivize people to behave in the right way so that the cartel persists yeah. and behave properly. And I think this is probably one of the innovation that is um, not quite looked at as much as it deserves. We're going to see that, I think, in, in other area develop. OK, great. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. But um, thank you both for your time. It's been a really interesting chat today. So we hope you watching have enjoyed our discussion today. As always, if you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to leave a comment below. We're always here to answer your questions, and we're here to encourage a little bit of debate. So thanks very much for watching Locad TV, and we'll see you again next time. Bye bye.